Ted Price, give him a great big God bless you. He's here, the one and only. Ooh, glory. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I couldn't pass that up. I meant I look good for 85. You know, I wasn't bragging. I mean, I, I do look good for 85. You know, you, you hope you look this good, brother. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But uh, let me say on behalf of my wife, Betty, that we certainly are privileged to be here tonight. I count it a very uh, high honor to have been asked, and I was so happy that scheduling permitted me to be a part of this conference because I've heard about it from almost its inception, and so I'm very honored to be here tonight. Now, <clears throat> let, let, let's... Let me lay a few ground rules before we get started so that uh, we don't have any misunderstandings, okay? I am your friend, okay? I, I, want, no, I want you to understand that I am here as a part of the family, okay? I'm in the body of Christ along with you. I have my assignment from the Lord. And it's different than everybody else's, just like everybody else's different than mine. We all have our little part to play and do what we're supposed to do and what we're anointed to do. And so I know that I'm going to get into some areas and say some things tonight that may sound almost antagonistic. And I only say this from previous experience. And I just was led to say this tonight. I've never done this before, what I'm doing now. But I, I didn't come to this conference to be sour grapes. I, I came here because I believe that God ordained it. Because I have never in all the years that I've ministered have ever asked for, looked for, went anywhere expecting to get something. I've never given anybody a card. I never tell anybody I'm in town. I have never tell anybody where I'm going. I'm never looking for a place to speak. I believe if God wants me to be somewhere and say something, he'll arrange it. And I don't have to do anything. And so that's my... That's my policy. So I was invited here by Carlton, and I believe that, that I'm here just to add to what's already been done and what's going to be done. So I want you to relax and know that I am your friend. I'm your brother in Christ. I want you to weigh what I say in light of the Word of God. Okay? Because I'm not coming against anybody. I only have one enemy. Now, there are a lot of people that don't, they can't handle me. That's their problem. But I only have one enemy, and that's Satan. That's, that's the only person I have. Okay, plus, you know, his demon host. So I want you to know when I say something, don't look around to see what somebody else is thinking about it. I don't know what anybody else has said because I wasn't here last night or this morning. So it might sound different, but when the Spirit of God moves, it's not different. It just may sound different to our ear, but if we have the wisdom to really weigh it, we'll find out that ultimately it all comes together to present Jesus as the one and only. So if, if you'll receive it like that, then I know that what I'll share with you tonight will be a blessing to you, okay? I'm not against anyone, okay? I'm not cutting across anybody. All right? So if it sounds that way, then that means that you should take that much more time to pay attention to it because God must be saying something. Because my purpose is only to edify, to build up, and to exhort, to inform, and to fulfill my mission. Fair enough? Let's pray, and we will get on down with the Word. Father, we praise you and we thank you for the privilege of gathering together. In the name of Jesus, our sincere and continuing desire is to know you more perfectly that we may serve you more faithfully. We thank you that we can call you Abba Father and that you're not ashamed to call us and own us as your very own children. We thank you for Jesus, our great Redeemer, our High Priest and coming King for all that he has done, for all that he is doing, and for all that he will do when he returns to receive us to himself. We thank you for the Holy Spirit whom you have sent into our midst 
to be our teacher and to be our guide. We know that without his anointing we can do nothing as we ought to do it. Without his inspiration and revelation we can know nothing as we ought to know it. But we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory that he is here and that he will guide us into the truth. I thank you that even now he is anointing every ear to hear and every heart to believe. And I thank you that my lips are now anointed to speak your word and that I will speak it accurately. And that revelation knowledge would flow freely in this service tonight, unhindered and unchecked by any force. And Father, I personally thank you that your word declares that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Therefore, with great boldness and confidence, I look to the greater one who indwells me. And I know that he will think through my mind, he will speak through my lips, and he will minister through this vessel of clay to your people. And for all that shall be revealed and for all that shall be manifested, we promise and covenant with you now in advance before we ever begin that we will give you alone all of the praise, the glory, the honor, the adoration, and all of the thanksgiving. For we ask it in Jesus' mighty and majestic name. And all who agreed with that prayer said, Amen. Amen. All right, please turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter Uno. And uno, for those of you that are uninitiated, is one in French. Okay. Unos, dos. Okay, that's, that's French. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I have your attention. <laughs> now, as I have had the privilege to move around the country over a period of time, I have been asked the question over and over again, what new thing is the Lord doing? Brother Price, what, what new thing is the Lord doing? Now remember, remember my preliminary remarks. Keep everything in context now, okay? And uh, I, I would say, well, I don't believe that God is doing anything new. Because, see, if God is doing something new, then that would mean something's wrong with the old. And there can't be anything wrong with what God does, because if there is, then that makes him imperfect. And if he's imperfect, we got a big problem. You, we still friends? Okay. Okay. Now, here's what I think is happening. God's doing the same thing that he's always done. It's just as he does it longer, it expands and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and encompasses more things. But I don't believe he's doing something what we call really new because there really wasn't anything wrong with the old. There was something wrong with us, but not anything wrong with the old. Wrong with our perception, wrong with our commitment to it, wrong with our appraisal of it. But there really wasn't anything wrong with it because if there was, then God's involved in producing imperfect things and he's perfect, so couldn't be anything wrong with it. You still here? Okay. Now, as God expands the vision and reveals a little bit more to us, because, see, he doesn't reveal the end at the beginning. He only reveals a little at a time, just enough to get you started in the right direction, and that's all you're going to get. Anytime you know what the end is going to be from the beginning, then God's not talking to you. You listen to a demon. God's not going to tell you the end, because, see, if he told you the end before the beginning, you'd have a heart attack. I know I would. If God had told me what, I, what he was going to have me doing today, I'd have said, uh, I think you called me to plow. You didn't call me to preach. <laughs> Where are the horses and the mules? Let me get to the field. <laughs> because I'd have been terrified, see. If God told you what you were going to be uh, coming into later on, it would terrify you, see. So he, and beside that, if, you, if he told you everything at the beginning, then you wouldn't need any faith. And that doesn't please him because he's a faith God. So he can only give you a little bit to get you to moving in faith. And as you take that first step, then he'll reveal the second step. As you take the second step, he'll reveal the third step. As you take the third one, he'll reveal the fourth one, etc. ad infinitum. Are you following what I'm talking about? Okay. So God is expanding the vision. Now, I don't care what's happening. And Christians have a bad habit of falling into the same trap that the world falls into. And that is that we always have to have, we think we have to have something new. 
See, every year they're changing the clothes. They, they come out with a, fine, a good kind of clothes, a good something. It looks good on you, fits good. The suckers change it on you. When the skirts were just the right length, then they raised them up. And then when we got used to them being up, then they lowered them down. And then when they got used to them lowered, and then they put them way down to the ankle. Remember that time they had it with the real long dresses? It looked so good. I said, boy, this is great. You know, even if you don't have good looking legs, you still look good in those dresses because they're long. They cover up all the imperfection. Then they raised them back up. Well, if they didn't do that, you wouldn't keep buying. It's called psychological obsolescence. They do it with the automobiles. They do it with the furniture. They do it with everything. Make you dissatisfied so you buy some more. And Christians have fallen into that same trap. I think about it when I first got into the, the charismatic renewal, as it were, some years back. And they came out with such beautiful songs. You never even hear these songs anymore. I mean, beautiful songs. I mean, how could you improve on Jesus, Jesus? There's something about that name. You hardly ever hear the song anymore. Gorgeous song. But we think we've got to have a new song for the hit parade like they do in the world. Now, sometimes we get this same idea in the things of the Spirit or the things that God is doing today and that he'll do tomorrow. Well... Whatever the vision expands into or flows into is going to have to be financed. Okay? It's going to cost money. And it's going to cost more and more money. But just like tonight. The man said it tonight when he came up here to receive the offer. Talking about $200,000 budget. Well, one of us should have been able to just write a check out for the $200,000 and get on with the program. But the reason you didn't write one, because you ain't got $200,000. That mean that's the only reason. That's the only reason. I know many of you, I mean, you love Carlton Pearson. I mean, you don't like him, you love him. You like him. But I mean, you, you appreciate what God has done in the man. And if you had, to, I'm sure we'd probably get $20 million out of this choir tonight. The only reason they didn't give the $200,000, they don't have it. That's all that stands between them writing a check. They don't have it. So whatever God is doing is going to cost money. Now that's a part of my ministry. I am called, some of, they call me this to, to try to put a hurting on me. But they don't know you can't hurt me. Man, I've been hurt by professionals. I'm immune to hurt. I have on my armor so you can't hurt me. But they have called me the prophet of prosperity. And I'm guilty as charged. <laughs> Hallelujah, I'm guilty as charged. <laughs> I love it. And that's what I've been led. In fact, I can't get off of this. My usual message or the usual area of, of emphasis that I do or that I'm involved in when, I, uh, when I'm away from my church is things that have to do with faith. That's, that's my primary ministry but for the last year and a half or so I haven't been able to get away from this message of prosperity and I want to talk to you tonight about prosperity I want to talk about some things that a lot of you don't know anything about and I certainly want to talk about some things that every person in this room tonight who is a person of color needs to hear now I say that only because at least in this country we are at the bottom of the economic totem pole by and large Thank God things are better than they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. But, but we have to relate things to the word of God, not to society. But people of color really need this message. We need it because we, we you know, ain't too many people of color that own airlines, that own railroads, that are the presidents of large corporations. That, that's what I mean. And so consequently, we've got to learn how to operate in what God intended for us to operate in in the first place, and that is in prosperity. And the bottom line of it all is that the gospel and the covenant of God might be established. See? And it takes money. Because see, after all the shouting is over, and all the hand clapping is done, and all the dancing up and down the aisle is over. And I love it. I think it's great. Nothing wrong in the world with it. But after all that, you're going to go home and still have to pay the light bill and the gas bill. And that old clunker that you're driving, you're going to still get to have to have some new tires for that sucker. And, if you, and you can't stand up in front of, of, of Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. <laughs> that ain't going to get it. That won't get it. I mean, that has its place. Don't, don't misunderstand me. You, you follow me? That, that, you, don't, don't misunderstand me. That, that has its place. I don't have any problem with it. But you can't stand in front of Goodyear or Bridgestone and say, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> you better come up with some long green, brother. A whole lot of green. Okay? 
So I, I want to just sort of deal with this, this practical aspect of it, and that's called prosperity. I'm going to show you tonight that Jesus was a rich man. I want to show you tonight that the apostles were rich men. I'm going to show you tonight that God wants you to be rich. Not as an end. Not as an end in itself. But as a means to an end, which is to establish God's covenant. Now, first thing I want to do is lay a little groundwork. Do you have Joshua yet? Chapter Uno, if you haven't found it now, forget it. You never will. So just forget it. But I, I'm assuming that you have. I want, let's look at the eighth verse. The first thing I want to do is to establish the fact that God wants you to prosper. See, the problem with most Christians is, is ignorance. See, they've been listening to the lies of, of the devil through... Now, now don't be offended now. <laughs> but they've been listening to the lie of the devil that has come from the pulpits across the world. Now, see, I didn't say which pulpit, see, so just keep looking straight ahead and smiling, and nobody will know I'm talking about you. Okay, just keep on smiling. Just look straight ahead. I mean, nobody won't know, because I'm not going to tell. If you don't tell, I won't tell. Scout's honor. I'm not going to tell it. Okay, but I say it like that because that's where it came from. They didn't get it out of the L.A. Times or the New York Times. They got it from the pulpit. Amen. I was talking to a guy the other day. I took my, took my wife somewhere and I dropped her off and I was coming from the parking lot. And I guess this man recognized me from television. I sure didn't know him. And so he had pulled his car to the side in this parking lot and he stopped. When I walked by, I said, Brother Price. And I said, yes. And so he, we, we began to talk. And boy, he got real serious. I mean, he, re he got real serious. And, and he said, you know, uh, I've never met you before. I've seen you on TV a few times, but... I, I, I've really heard some, well, I don't guess you, you probably don't want to hear this anyway. I said, man, go ahead and say it. You know, we may, I might learn something. Don't be, don't be concerned. He said, well, I, I've heard some, well, you know, it's like gossip and, 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 and it's really, it's really bad, Brother Price. He was really serious. He looked at me like he was a baby Christian. He was real serious about this. And he said, you know, I, I heard that you drive a Rolls Royce. I mean, he was really serious about this. And I said, man, don't let that bother you. I do. <laughs> no problem. I do. I, yeah, I drive a Rolls Royce. Sure. Yeah. I said, what's wrong with that? He said, well, but we're supposed to be. Yeah, I know. We're supposed to be poor, huh? Well, no, we spo you know, we're supposed to be, you know, we're supposed to be humble. And, 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 and you know, we're, we're not supposed to. I said, well, wait a minute. Have you ever thought about this? I live in a community where people are killing one another, young people, by the droves. And some of the people that are doing the killing are driving around at 16 and 17 year old in $70,000 Mercedes-Benz automobiles. And a lot of our younger people who have become disenfranchised with the educational system look at that and they say why go to school and spend all that time getting a degree so I can have me a Mercedes Benz I can have one like that all I got to do is push some drugs now that's not all life is about understand I believe me I have enough sense to know that but we all affect people in different ways and I consider myself to be uh, a lamb I'm not a light because Jesus is the light, but I'm the lamp that holds the light. And I want, people need to see that that's just one facet of it. But I want the drug pusher and I want the kids that are, that are tempted in that direction, I want them to see me drive up in my Rolls Royce. And then when we engage in conversation, I want them to know that I don't have to kill my other brothers and sisters to get a car like this that I can serve the living God and exalt the name of Jesus Christ and still drive a Rolls Royce now that might not be your calling so keep on driving your Ford and be happy about it but don't get upset about me driving my Rolls because I asked my father for it and he gave it to me okay so don't, don't knock it, but, but, but and he said, oh, 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 oh I, I never thought about that. I know you never thought about a whole lot of things. And I started rapping on him, and I gave him the word on prosperity. 
And uh, when, he, when I got through with him, he said, well, well, praise God, praise God, bless God, brother. It's good to see you, see. And uh, all because of ignorance. See, we've listened to the devil's lie that, that God has created all these wonderful things for the pimps and the pushers and the whores and the drug pushers and the drug dealers. But Christians, we should be more humble and drive around in chariots. Okay? Now, understand again, to each his own. That might not be your calling, but don't knock me. You don't know what God told me to do. Okay? So the best thing to do is just keep your mouth and your hand off of this anointed vessel. Okay? And drive your smoking, rattling, beat up, broken down, chintzy, oil burning wreck. Leave me alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, leave me alone. Oh, yeah. Oh, where am I now? Here. Oh, yeah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. I, I have your attention now. All right. That just that's just preliminary. Now let's look at the word. Let's look at the word. Then I'll balance all of this out with the word of God. All right. That that this is my calling. This is my anointing. I have to stand before God and give an account for the stewardship of my ministry. Draw from it what you can, whatever you can't. Put it on the shelf. You're going to need it later on. Because you see, as we move further on into things that God is doing, it's going to cost us increasingly more and more and more money to get the job done. And somebody's going to have to foot the bill. I have been sending letters on a regular basis to the Godfather, but for some strange reason, he never answers my letters. I've asked him for donation. Now, see, people get upset when I say, say, my God, I wouldn't say anything as sacrilegious as that. The Godfather. Yeah. Yeah, but that money, they got that money from drugs. So, what do you think you got the money you just drew out from the bank? Where do you think that came from? How do you know where that came from? Money is neutral. Money is not bad. Money is neutral. It's what you do with it that makes the difference. Yeah, if the Godfather sent donations, I, absolutely. Here's the greatest miracle in the world. We got the devil working for the kingdom of God. That's great, man. I'm talking about, don't knock that. Sure. But the children of God are going to have to finance God's program. See? And where is it going to come from? It's going to come from the people of God. Well, they can't give what they don't have. Twelve years ago, I started out in television. The Lord told me to go on TV and he told me exactly what to do. And that's, you know, he said, don't sing, don't, don't have any choirs, don't do it. Just teach what I taught you. That's all he wanted me to do is teach. And so that's what I've done for 12 years. We started off in one station, the first station that we went on. And uh, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, that station cost to, to produce a program, to produce a program, put it in the can, buy the airtime, put it on the air, cost me $4,000. 4000 bucks an hour. $4,000 an hour. I've been on that station for 13 years. 14. My resource. That's why I bring my wife with me. And uh, 14 years. And so 14 years later, I'm on the same station. Hey, they didn't give us no more, no more minutes in the hour. Same, same amount of time. That station now cost me $30,000 an hour. And we're on 141 stations. We're talking about mega bucks. Man, they don't have that many chickens in captivity to sacrifice to pay for that kind of stuff. And they don't have enough ribs to barbecue to handle $30,000 an hour. And that's just one station and we got 139 more behind. That's why when the brother get on TV and whine and cry and beg and shed tears and beg, don't get on their case. Because if you don't know how to operate by faith and by the principles of the word of God, you got to cry often and loud because it don't take but one week and you bankrupt. Can you imagine missing the payments on 141 stations at $30,000 an hour per station? One week? You out of business, bro. <laughs> you can forget it. You in bank, they'll bury you and put you in debtor's prison for the rest of your life. But think about it. Think about it. A man of color 
14 years on television, never, ever, one single time ever missed making a payment. Not once. N never been behind one time. Not once in 14 years. Paid every bill 30 days in advance. 14 years. All by these principles that I'm going to share with you in a few minutes. Amen. Hallelujah. You find Joshua yet? Look at verse 8. This book of the law, now remember this, when it says the law, it, it simply means the word of God. Because God's word to the children of Israel at that time was contained within the confines of the law. So to them, God's word was the law. Okay, but it's the same as, it's a synonym for God's word. Call it the law, the Pentateuch, whatever you want to call it, it's still God's word. So it says, the book, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. That means you don't ever stop talking God's word. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do, that thou mayest observe to do, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then, for then, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Now I want to stop right there because the church has very gravely erred in this situation. I've heard people say, well, the Lord is going to do this and the Lord is going to do that and God is going to bless me. God is going to do this, that and the other. Now I want you to take it in the, in the context that I'm giving it in. Add it to what you've heard because this is not coming against anything or anybody. It's an expansion on. I want you to see another level of it. I want you to see another facet. A diamond has many sides to it. It's one diamond but many facets. They all reflect the light in a different way. Okay, but now listen to this. He says, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. I submit to you tonight that your prosperity is your fault. I said, your prosperity is your fault. Now, when we say fault, we usually mean that in a negative sense. I mean it in a positive sense. In other words, it's your responsibility whether you prosper, not God's. Because, see, if we really think about it, the way that we really viewed God, we have made God violate his own word because his word says that he is not a respecter of persons. But when we talk about God, our Father, and the way that he blesses people, we make him a respecter of persons because he is not blessing everybody materially, and financially, the same way. You got Christians on welfare tonight. You have Christians that don't have a home. You have Christians that have financial problems that's overwhelming them. Now, if God is just indiscriminately blessing them, he's supposed to love us all equally. He has no favorites. Yet some are prospering materially and some are not. So if they're not, it can't be God. See, I used to think it was God until I got clued into the word and I found out it wasn't God. It's not up to God whether I prosper. It's up to me whether I prosper. If I fail, it's up to me. It's my fault, not God. He's already provided everything that we need. You have never in your life ever seen a hundred dollar bill come down from heaven, from heaven to this earth. All the wealth that you need or will ever need or that any ministry will ever need to do the job that God called you to do is already in this earth realm. Not one dollar, not one thousand dollar bill, not one checkbook, nothing has fallen out of the sky. It's already here. It's already here. But it's just in the hands of the wrong people. Because Satan is the god of this world. And he has very cleverly pulled the resources of the world into the hands of a few people to keep it out of the hands of the children of God. And they don't have enough sense to understand that. To know how to go forth and bring it back into the kingdom of God so that the covenant of God can be established. There is no shortage of wealth. You hear them all the time talking about fossil fuels are going out. They're talking about we're running out of this and running out of that and running out of the other. You have never, ever heard a newscaster come on the 6 o'clock evening news and say, Ladies and gentlemen, I have very terrible news for you tonight. We're running out of money. We're running out of wealth. Never. You never hear, you've never heard that. It's because there's plenty of money. Problem is that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't have it. Plenty of it out there. I know a man. I know a man. I know a man. That has 34 billion dollars. He lives in a house that costs 300 million dollars. One man. One man. 
his house cost three hundred million dollars and he is reputed to be and you know nobody tells the real truth so if it's 34 billion that he lets them think he has he's got more than that one can you imagine how many conferences we could pay for how many maybe centers we could build how many missionaries we could support how many churches we could build and establish how many Bibles could be printed 300 million bucks we ought to have that kind of money the body of Christ ought to have it for the purpose of proclaiming the gospel I'm gonna show you how to get it tonight alright for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success now in my Bible I have a reference Bible and in the center margin it has a or actually by the word have in my Bible it has a two a numeral two and if you go over to the center margin it says deal wisely some translations say deal wisely in the affairs of life but I actually like what the King James Bible says it says have good success and I believe that's very important and critical to us to understand that statement see notice what he says if we observe to do if we meditate day and night if we if we don't let God's word out of our mouths he says then we shall make Make our way prosperous and then but only then shall we have good success I like the term good success because see the word good is a relative term when the word good is used it implies bad if there's only one thing then you wouldn't use a term that has an opposite to it see good bad up down in out light dark tall short fat thin are you following me so when he says then thou shalt have good success. The reason he says that is because there's bad success. See? And he doesn't want you to have bad success. He wants you to have good success. What's bad success? Well, bad success is having $12 million in your portfolio, in your, in your statement, financial statement. And the gardener is making it with your wife. The cat raped the canary just this morning. All your kids are on drugs. And all the people that are supposed to be your friends, you're not really sure whether they're your friends or whether they want what you have. You can't eat because your stomach is eaten up with ulcers worrying about who's trying to steal your money. But you got $12 million in the bank, three Rolls Royces and a yacht and your own private Learjet. That's bad success. Now what's good success? The $12 million, the three Rolls Royces, the yacht, your own plane, and your loving tender wife at your side waiting for you every day when you come home from work and all your kids are anointed and filled with the Holy Ghost and ball in the ministry. Healthy, wealthy, and wise. That's good success. You see the difference? So he said if we will meditate in that word, then we'll make our way prosperous. See, we will do it. Not God will. We will. Because the resources are already here. God doesn't have to give you anything. It's already here. All you've got to do is go get it. But you can't go get it if you don't know you're supposed to and if you don't know how. All right, look at Psalm 1. The first Psalm. Very familiar, but there's an area here I want you to see. Psalm 1. Oh, my goodness. I can see I'm already off target. But the Holy Ghost do what he'd be wanting to do. And so we just be following him because. All right. Psalm 1 verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his, but his delight is in the law or the word of the Lord. <clears throat> and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Oh, there's that day and night again. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall fail. Master. What? Master. What? Master. Why are you whispering? Master. Oh, okay. So whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That means his home, his marriage, his business, raising of his children, his ministry shall prosper God is the author of prosperity I, will, I run into preachers all the time all over the country whining and crying and belly aching now see understand where remember my re preliminary remarks now don't, don't get you know don't get bent out of shape I'm your friend I'm trying to help you this is just my my method everybody does something different I can't sing like this lady and I can't dance like Carlton Everybody's got their gift to God. You do what you can do. See what I mean? This is my way. This is the way God uses me. So don't be offended by it. I don't know you personally. Not interested in trying to put a hurting on you. Trying to help you to get free. But I hear ministers all the time crying and whining. I want to punch him in the mouth. In love. Oh, in love. 
but I want to punch him in the mouth. And I want to tell him, well, why don't you do what God says do? And especially when they're white. Now, don't be offended now, please. Now, especially when they're white, because see, if you don't make it in America white, you're not saved. You're definitely not called. In fact, you're not even alive. You got to be dead. Because after all, this is, this is the white man's country, and God is white. And the Holy Ghost is white. Ain't they? Well, yeah, God is white. It's got to be white. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. All right, and he shall be like a tree planted. See, I tell him, look, look, man, I'm, look at me. Okay, okay, do you see a difference in my complexion and yours? Now, you know, now, you know, since God is white, if he's going to bless anybody, he's going to bless white ministry. But look what we're doing in the ghetto. We're we, we not in the suburbs. We be in the, in the ghetto. It ain't, it, it's not supposed to happen in the ghetto. Not in the ghetto. Not in Los Angeles. In the ghetto. We, we in the ghetto. We, we be suntan complexion. And, 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 and we built... We, we built a 12 million dollar sanctuary and didn't one chicken die to pay for it no Katie did candy mm. we didn't have one pew rally yeah, and we didn't have a pastor's aid club to help me out. Mm, yeah. Yeah. We didn't have a men's day. Didn't have a women's day. Didn't have a usher's day. We just took God at his word. In the ghetto. Not the suburbs. And, and, and then on top of that, the, the, the ground on which the $12 million sanctuary sits that's paid for, the ground, that's 32 acres right in the heart of the ghetto. 32 acres that the mayor, the mayor of Los Angeles, California, Tom Bradley, looked me in the eye and the man thinks I can do anything. He thinks I'm a miracle worker because the city of Los Angeles tried to buy Pepperdine University, their old campus, and the city couldn't strike a deal. But the ghetto buster did. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because see, my God told me if I meditate day and night, if I don't let his word leave my mouth, if I observe to do, he said I'd make my way prosperous. And so we, we, we offered him $14 million for the land and then paid for it. Yeah, and didn't sacrifice the chicken, didn't have a hog sale, didn't have a car wash, didn't have a, a Sunday afternoon tea, and show sure enough, didn't have no fashion show. In the ghetto, I found out God is not prejudiced. God is colorblind. The only color God responds to is F-A-I-T-H. And I got the goods to prove it. 
And you can call it bragging if you want. That's your problem, not mine. All right, do you, do you have it now? And he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever you do, it shall prosper. Everything you do should prosper. If you're not prospering in everything you do, then there's a problem with you, not with God. And you can't blame it on the white folks, the Russians, the flying saucers. You can't blame it on anybody, the drug pushers. And all. You can't blame it on anybody but the person that you see in the mirror when you go in the bathroom and lock the door and there ain't nobody else in the room but you. That's the one you got to point the finger at. You are the problem. Not even the devil can stop you. See, notice this verse. Did you notice that in this third verse, Satan's name is not mentioned? He hasn't anything to do with anything except but what you let him have to do with. He said, if you'll do what I say here, he said, whatever you do shall prosper. Now look at the 37th or 35th Psalm. Here's one that some of you have never seen. This will blow your boat right out of the water. But I want to establish the fact that God wants you to prosper. See, in order to prosper, you have to change your way of thinking about money. And Christians are hung up. See, they're hung up about material things. I run into them all the time. And, and they, want to, they want to get on my case, and I want to punch them in the mouth with the Word of God. I want to cram it right down there. They'll say, why don't you read the book, brother, sister? Instead of getting upset about me, why don't you read the book? See, they know I'm right. That's why they get on my case. Because if I wasn't right, why would you waste any time? What, what, I, what I say wouldn't matter. It doesn't change what God's going to do. See what I mean? So why get upset? They get upset because deep down inside, they know they're right. Have you, have you as pastors ever had anybody come and ask you this question? Uh, Pastor, I, I, uh, I, I, I wonder, is it all right for Christians to smoke? Have you ever had any, uh, any Christian ask you that? I'll tell you what you've never had a Christian do, though. You've never had a Christian ask you, uh, uh, Pastor, I, 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 is it all right if Christians use deodorant? No, you, you, you didn't get the point. See, they know that's right to do. When they ask you, sh should Christians smoke, they already have their answer. What they want you to do is to agree with them so they can smoke. They already know it's wrong. If it wasn't wrong, they wouldn't ask the question. Well. Well, well, well. Mm, yes. <laughs> Are you getting the message? See, you, you did this, Carlton. I don't usually do this. I got in your presence, man. And like the man said, the anointing just got all on. Mm. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. You know, you can have fun in Jesus. See, a lot of you don't know that. and You don't know God has a sense of humor. And if you doubt it for a minute, go home tonight and look in the mirror and you'll find out. <laughs> got a great sense of humor. Hallelujah. All right. You know, y'all got to be serious tonight now. All right. Psalm 35, verse 27. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually. How often? I said, how often? I can't hear you. All right. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Question. What is the opposite of pleasure? Displeasure. What is the opposite of prosperity? Poverty. What is the opposite of a servant? A child. One opposite. A child. All right. Now, if God hath pleasure. Now, listen to this carefully. You'll learn something. This can be worth $10 million to you. If God has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, then he has to have displeasure in the poverty of his servant. And so if he does, then God could have nothing to do with poverty. Now, think about this, that here in the psalm, he's writing about servants. If he has pleasure in the prosperity of the gardener 
and the butler and the upstairs maid and the housekeeper and the downstairs maid, if he has pleasure in the servant's prosperity, can you imagine what he must have for his blood-bought, blood-washed children when they prosper? God has pleasure in the prosperity. You know why? Because, you see, the world can only see God through us. And whatever you are and however you look, that's the way God looks to them. That's why more people haven't been breaking down the doors of the churches to get to us to get the answers to the issues of life. When they see us Saturday afternoon with some big 50-gallon oil drum cut in half, barbecuing some ribs, selling them to any Tom, Dick, and Harry that comes along, poor old God is so poor, in order to keep the kingdom afloat, he's got to sell barbecue chicken dinner to the world. It is a disgrace. I said it's a disgrace. Yeah. Rummage sales. Bingo games. Hey, guess what? And ain't no point you rolling your little old pee peeking eyes at me because I'll come right out there and slap you upside your head. You don't intimidate me. Well. <laughs> All right. Now listen. Listen. You see, you have to change your mind about Jesus and the apostles or you'll never be able to operate in prosperity. That's why Christians stay down and that's why the church has been limited in what God can do through it because of the finances. And it, as I say, it's costing us more and more and more and more and more and more and more to proclaim the gospel. It costs more and more and more. Somebody's got to foot the bill. God's not here to do it. He can only do it through the body of Christ and to the extent that they have the resources to put into the kingdom. Are you following me? So we've got to get our hands on it because it's out there. Are you following me? But this is why people have a problem with, with tithing, and it's why they have a problem with, with overweight. This is one of the areas where the Lord uses me. People get mad at me, you know. And man, you know, I don't, you know, guess what? You know what? If, brother, if you weighed 795 pounds, I think you would be considered by most people as slightly overweight. But think about it. If he did weigh that much, what's that to me? Nothing. Ain't hurting nothing I'm doing. Amen. If he weighs 750 pounds, so what do I care? I, as long as I don't have to buy his clothes and feed this sucker. <laughs> Are you following me? So people ought to have enough sense to realize why, you know, I don't go out getting on folks because they're overweight. I don't care whether you're overweight. The only person I care about being overweight is my wife. <laughs> and I got something to say about that. <laughs> Well, hmm. yeah, right? But God, God uses me in this way because, see, I don't have any hang-ups. I don't have any problems, and I can't be intimidated. Yeah. See, I, some ministers, they couldn't dare talk about things like this, and that's why, that's why you got churches full of fat folk. I mean, when I say fat, I mean overweight people that are killing themselves and digging their own graves with their mouths. And, and look, like I said, don't be rolling your eyes at me. Because what? Guess what? I didn't make you fat. I didn't buy one of them cream pies. Ha <laughs> ha! And when you get mad at me. I don't like French fries. I know you don't. Neither does the devil. It's all right. <laughs> it's all right, I said. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's all right. But here's what I'm talking about. Now, it's, it may sound a little comical, but there's great truth in what I'm trying to get across to you here relative to finances. And I want you to get this relative to prosperity. See, that's why people have problems with overweight and dieting. That's why they have problems with fasting. I mean, uh, with uh, tithing. Because they haven't changed their minds. 
You've got to change your mind about money if you're going to ever fast, I mean ever tithe successfully. And you're going to have to change your mind about food if you're going to ever lose weight and keep it off. See, the easiest thing in the world is to lose weight. All you got to do is stop eating. It's guaranteed. You stop eating, you're going to lose weight. You stop eating long enough, you're going to lose more weight. See, you're not going to have any weight problem. You just stop eating because that's what makes weight is eat. It ain't heredity, it's eat. It's real simple, it's eat. Eat makes fat. It's impossible, you never see people starve to death at 375 pounds. When they starve, they're skin and bones. And we see them late night television all the time with flies buzzing all over, trying to get us to send some money to feed them. And they're skin and bones, they're little swollen bellies you stop eating you lose weight but you can go out and some of you know this is the truth you've gone on diets and you've actually legitimately lost the weight and then the weight came right back more came right back and all and it's real simple you never change your mind about food and until you change your mind about food you'll always gain the weight back there's no way to keep it off People have a problem with tithing. They're always in a problem with tithing. That's because you've got to change your mind about money. See, you say you make $100 a week. If you're going to tithe, you don't make $100 a week. You only make $90 a week, and you can only obligate yourself financially for $90. If you do that, you'll never steal from God, and you'll never take his tithe. But if you keep thinking $100, I make $100, and you're going to obligate yourself financially to the $100, and you're going to end up stealing from God. You've got to change your mind about money. I don't make $100. I only make $90. I don't make $1,000. I only make $900. I can't spend $1,000. I can only spend $900. And if you do that, you'll never steal God's tithe. But you have to change your mind. Are you following me about your money? Now, it's the same thing about prosperity. You've got to change your mind because you see the euro seems centric picture that we have traditionally seen concerning Jesus and the apostle has been one virtually of poverty and having nothing of this world's goods. When you see Jesus, when you see the apostle, you get this idea that they didn't have anything from a material point of view. But I'm here to tell you that the man was wealthy. And I'm going to prove it to you in just a few moments. Jesus had a lot of money. A lot of money. I'll prove it to you from the Bible, from the B-I-B-L-E. I, I'm going to show you from the book. That Jesus was wealthy and all the apostles were rich men. You see, we haven't heard that before. I mean, you get the idea here. You know, here, here's Jesus walking down the road and here's a guy sitting there. Uh, they're on by the, down by there washing some nets at, at, the, at the lake, at the, at the uh, ocean, the lake there. Lake of Genesaret. And he says, uh, y'all come follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. The Bible says immediately they forsook their nets and followed him. Man, what kind of magical hold did he have on somebody? That he could just say, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And they just dropped everything and left. Here's a man collecting taxes. You know that sucker had some money. They got all the money, them tax folk. And this guy's collecting taxes, Matthew, and he says, come follow me. And he just drops everything and starts off and follows Jesus. You ever, have you ever thought in your mind? No, we've never thought about how in the world did he entice them to follow him. See, we haven't, we haven't been told that. And we get this idea that Jesus and the apostle didn't have anything materially speaking. And so for me to think that I should drive around in a Rolls Royce when my Lord walked everywhere he went and rode on a donkey. How presumptuous can Fred Price be to think you're more spiritual than the Lord? <laughs> and so what happens that keeps us bound. All right, turn to Matthew chapter 8 and Mark chapter 4. Two references. Oh, my, 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 my. Matthew chapter 8 and Mark chapter 4. <clears throat> because I, as I see the church moving on, as I say, you see, our nation is in trouble financially. I mean, you talk about a company like General Motors talking about closing 12 factories and laying off 70,000 people. Man, that is awesome. And it's going to get worse. Our nation is in turmoil economically and financially. They haven't told us all the truth. There are things that are happening behind the scenes. We are, we are in a bankrupt situation. We have debt in our nation that our children's children's grandchildren's dog won't be able to pay off. And it's getting worse by the year. And yet there really is no, no lack of wealth 
See, that's the thing about it. See, with all this recession and all the problems, that sucker still got $34 billion in the bank and he's still living in a $300 million house and the rest of the world starving. So something's wrong, see? Huh? Something's wrong. There's plenty of wealth, but it's just in the wrong hands. And if we, the church, don't learn how to operate in God's financial plan and understand that God wants you to prosper in a material and financial way, the church is going to be, most churches are going to have to close. You won't be able to stay open. You won't be able to. It's cost too much money and it's going to cost more. It costs more and more and more and more. I mean, we have 200 employees, over, actually over 200 employees that work for Crenshaw Christian Center Church. We have people make $50,000, $60,000, $70,000 salary. And I ain't talking about me. And it, it costs more and more because it costs them the same amount of money to buy a gallon of gas as it does for Donald Trump to buy a gallon of gas. <laughs> probably costs them more because he got all kind of insights and inroads and he probably oil, owns one of the oil companies and got his own gas station. But it's going to cost us more and more money. I mean, Carlton, think about it. How long have you been in the ministry? You know, preaching, let's say, on a full-time basis. 15 years. Could you even have imagined 15 years ago having to be involved with a $200,000 budget? If you're like me, I, that's, I mean, it's incredible. It's, it's just, it's, it's uh, Star Wars. I mean, can you, $200,000, would you want to be responsible this week? Here the man, right here. Because he, all the rest of y'all going to be going and leaving. He going to be left with the $200,000. He, he got to be paying it. Y'all going to be going bye-bye down to the ocean side or somewhere on vacation. He's going to be left. Who in the world wants to sign your name and be responsible? $200,000. 15 years ago, that was absolutely absurd to think about something like that. Now, next year, the year after that, five years from now, $300,000, $400,000 for the same thing. That's the thing about it. It's getting costing more and more. These airtime, they, want to, they go up on our airtime every single year for 13 years. $4,000 to thirty, dollars and they want more. It's going to cost $100,000 before it's over. Who's going to pay for it? Are you getting it? Are you, are you still here? And if we don't learn how to get it, we're not going to be able to survive. We're going to be priced out of the marketplace. All right, Matthew 8. Now listen to this. <clears throat> listen to this, because here's one of the things that the devil has used to cripple the body of Christ from a prosperity point of view and from a financial point of view. You know, Christians, they don't like to talk about money. And I, and I see some of them sometimes in ministry, and they just get hostile with me. They don't want to talk about money. But then they'll get up and take 17 hours to receive $35.75 offering. And that's when I want to go off. Boy, I mean off on them. So you getting on my case and it takes me five minutes to receive a $150,000 offering. Five minutes in my church. Five minutes. Five. I said five. <laughs> But you, you, you criticizing me and on my case, and you the one taking three hours to raise thirty-seven fifty, and I get hundred and fifty thousand dollars in five minutes. All right, y'all ready? Okay. Matthew chapter 8. Boy, I have never gone this way in my life. I've never done this in my whole life. I don't know what all this is about, but I'm having fun, really. <laughs> this is different. This is different. Really, this is absolutely different. I never... Lord. Mm, mm, mm. And I can't get away. I can't get out of here. Mm, it's y'all's fault. You, you guys started it. When I came in here tonight, y'all was... Mm, you, get, you guys started. I'm going to blame you guys. All right, listen to this now. Matthew chapter 8, verse 20. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Oh, my goodness, poor old, poor Jesus. See, that's where we get this. That's where this thing came from. Oh, poor Jesus, he had nowhere to lay his head. <laughs> and what we have thought that meant was that he didn't have anything materially. That's not what the man said at all. Now, watch me prove this to you. Not me. Watch the word prove it. 
Okay, look at uh, Mark chapter 4. Now, now notice what we just read. He said, the Son of Man hath not where to what? Lay his head. Mark chapter 4. <laughs> Mark chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 35. And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. I thought he had nowhere to lay his head. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you see it? Huh? Did you see it? Listen, and he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. Yes. Come on. Beg your pardon? But I thought he had nowhere to lay his head. See, we misinterpreted that. What he meant was, see, you have to learn how, I, I hate to use the term read between the lines, but you do have to learn how to see some things by using your intellect anointed by the Holy Spirit directed by your recreated human spirit to see some things that God didn't write down in the word but gave you a brain and a recreated human spirit and then anointed you by the Holy Spirit to figure out for yourself you see if you read the Bible it would be a totally inaccurate picture of history of man on the earth. And the reason that it is is because it's not a history of man on the earth. The Bible is his story, history, his story about God redeeming man. That's all that's in the book is redemption. That's why you never hear dogs barking. You ever, you ever think about it? You never hear about dogs barking? Did you notice it never talk in all four Gospels? You never hear about a rainy day. It had to rain sometime, but the Bible never mentions rain. They couldn't go out today because it was raining. The crowds were small because it was raining, because it was bad weather. You know why it doesn't mention rain or weather? Because rain and weather has nothing to do with your redemption. So you've got to be able to figure some things out for yourself. And so God doesn't write every single thing down. But it's in there if you have the spiritual insight to ferret it out. And just like that, Jesus said, the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. If he didn't have anywhere to lay his head, then that meant he stayed awake for three and a half years of his ministry. That's absurd. He couldn't have done that. Or else he lay, lay down on a bed and held his head out over the side of the bed and didn't have his head lying on anything. That's stupid. But you think about it. You know, when it says the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head, what do you picture? You picture a man who didn't have anything materially. That's not what he meant. He meant, hey, I'm here on an assignment. I'm only here for three and a half years. Ain't no point in me taking a ranch or a townhouse or a country estate. No point in me getting married and having children and have to leave a wife with five kids and no father. I'm only going to be here for three and a half years. That was his purpose. He could have had anything he wanted. He had plenty of money, and I'm going to show you that in just a few moments. But when he said he had nowhere to lay his head, the book just got through saying the man was asleep on a pillow. What, normally pillows, what do you do? I never put pillows under my feet per se. I know there are situations where you, because of elevation and so forth, but ordinarily pillows are for your head. Yes. Well, he said he had nowhere to lay his head, and yet the book said he's asleep on a pillow. The Bible contradicted itself then. No, it was the point when he said the son of man had nowhere to lay his head. He simply meant I'm not taking up residence here. Because I'm not going to be here on a permanent basis. I'm only here for a little while. Now, if you're willing to handle that and deal with that and travel with me, then let's get it on. That's all he was talking about. He had somewhere to lay his head. Okay? Now, look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. I got to move real fast because my time is just about out. Okay. So, I'm just going to give you some, 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 some highlights here. Hope it will stimulate you into just doing a little more thinking. Okay, now here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, Paul speaks to Timothy and says, charge them that are what? Rich where? See, not in the afterlife, not in heaven, in this world. Okay, he said, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who giveth us richly and that's a very interesting word in the Greek it literally means lavishly copiously and abundantly yeah. 
who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Can you read? Yeah. Verse 18, that they do good. And honey, you can do a whole lot more good with money than you can with the welfare check. You can do a whole lot more good. And I see it on every Sunday. My program on Sunday morning in L.A. comes on a particular station. And right before that, they have a, a program that comes on. And it's a program of, about missions, ministering to people in the inner city. And 99% and, and of their whole broadcast, and I'm not knocking this. I'm only making an observation. Please believe me. I'm not putting this down. But the whole broadcast is spent on the monies that they need to keep feeding these people. Somebody wrote out a $200,000 check. He wouldn't have any problem with the money. So the problem is it still boils down to money. That's their problem. You can buy all the food. They're making the food. Anything you need, they got it. You can have it. All you got to do is pay for it. All it takes is money. That's all that stands between them fulfilling that ministry. But they're crying on TV. When I say crying, you know, because that's the only, that's their, you know, the constituency that they have to, to, to draw from. And they're all the time talking about money. I want to find out what are y'all doing. Tell me some more about the stuff. They're spending all the time with the money. And the reason they're doing it is because they need the money. And Christians don't give that much because they ain't got that much to give. Amen. All right. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Now, here's what I want you to go back to. Look at the 17th verse. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. Now, most of the time when you've read that verse, you've thought about rich people in the world not rich Christians. This is not talking about rich people in the world. It's talking about rich Christians. They had rich Christians back there. Because Christians, have you ever met Donald Trump? And you, you possibly never will. And certainly you will never get an opportunity to sit down and talk with him about his life. More than likely. Because you don't run in his circles. You probably ride in tourist class or coach. He rides in first class. The only people going to get to talk to him are those that ride in first class. That's why I only fly first class. They don't even let you come up from coach in tourist class into first class. Then some of you Christians, you got this, you got this poverty mentality. Well, I got to pay all that money. The plane's going to get on the ground at the same time. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to pay all that money. My God, I can ride for $300 and it cost me $1,200 in first class. Yeah, you're selfish and all you're thinking about is your own scrawny neck. You're only thinking about what you can do for you. What about people that ride in first class that are presidents of companies and corporations? Who's going to minister to them? Not you because you back there into tourist class. But see, you don't care about the rest of the world. You think that Christ died for Christians. You don't think Christ died for every man. You don't believe that God so loved the world. Because if God so loved the world, then that means God loves people like Donald Trump and other people that are multimillionaires and some of the movie stars that make 10 and 15 million dollars per movie. How are you going to witness to them and talk to them right in tourist class? And you're never going to meet them at the Rolls Royce dealership when they bring their car in for repair because you're driving a Ford. And you don't take a Ford to the Rolls Royce dealership to get it fixed. And they ain't going to bring their Rolls Royce into the Ford dealership so you are never going to talk to them about Jesus. Well, then who's going to reach them? I know. Let them go to hell, right? Charge them that are rich in this world. It's talking about rich Christians. Because Christians are never going to tell the rich what to do with their wealth. Right. You're not even going to get that chance. So he couldn't be talking about Christians telling sinners what to do with their wealth. He's talking about rich Christians and they had them back there. He didn't say tell them to get rid of their riches. Just tell them don't trust in it. Don't trust in it. All right. Now, let's move on quickly because I'm way out of time here. I'll be finishing about another hour. <laughs> no, I'll be finishing in a few moments. Ago. But I just want to give you a little highlight. I can see right now I can't make it. I can't make this. But let me give you a couple of highlight things, just enough to stimulate your thinking. Turn to Mark chapter 1. Turn to Mark chapter 1. <clears throat> just enough to, just to get you to thinking about this. 
I knew I didn't have a, a, you know, enough time to really develop it fully. And then the Lord always has me going in another direction when I get there. But just to plant some seeds. If you're, see, if you're interested in if I can just, if God can just get one more person like myself to get a hold of this, you can change something. You can make an impact. See what I mean? And this is what God wants to do. It's not, it's not for you. It's not for me. It's for the kingdom. And see, the thing about it that's so beautiful that in the process of fulfilling the covenant, all your little old Mickey Mouse stuff gets taken care of. And then you have an abundant supply. See, while the critics are talking about me, I always like to think, well, okay, how much money did you put in the kingdom last year? You're talking about me and throwing rocks at me. Sucker, how much money did you put in the kingdom? you so right and I'm so wrong. How much were your offerings? Think about it. I got about, well, they say on number about 14,000 members. And they don't all show up every week, but it's supposed to be 14,000 members. I, my wife and I give more every week than any other member in the church. I'm, I'm not going to tell you how much we give, but I give over, every seven days, over $2,000 in the offering. Now, now, understand this. See, you have to understand me because people that don't understand, oh, my God. God, I've never heard that bread price is the biggest braggart I've ever heard in my life. You know, you BB brain sucker, listen, 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 listen. And, and I didn't call your name, see, so don't get upset about that. He said, I don't know why he called me. I didn't call, is that your name? If you keep smiling and looking straight ahead, nobody will know that it's you. I'm not going to tell it if you don't. I'm trying to get your attention, that's all. Don't be offended. I didn't call your name, see. That's just the way the Lord deals with me. Hey, you know, everybody does their thing, you know. Huh? Now, what was I talking about? You made me, what was I, what was I talking about? What? Yeah, right. That's just, that's what I said. That's what I was talking about. What I, what I get. See, here, think about it this way. I gave, I've been giving it for years. I gave before I told you that I gave it. I already gave it. Given it gonna keep on in fact I got next week's offering already written out in the offering envelope at home in a little place where I store it already for next week to give to the church see now, so telling you doesn't change anything I don't have to brag I already did it. I'm getting credit for it I mean don't I look prosperous you know I'm giving see, I'm giving over two thousand dollars a week now like I say I'm not I'm not saying that to impress you but see if you understood where I came from and realized just a few years ago they repossessed my car they repossessed the television set they took back all the credit cards and I stood I had to stand in the court and file bankruptcy bankrupt preacher yes judge I ain't got no money Lord and, and I need your message judge please have mercy on me Lord mm, yeah. I don't know how I'm going to feed my family, but I'm standing here in the courtroom, judge, and I'm asking for your mercy. Yeah. That's not going to get it. Yeah. Yeah. Fred Price in the court declaring bankruptcy. I was bankrupt. Born again. Bankrupt. And now today, see, now the only reason I'm saying it is for the contrast between the two. God, the Bible says, God never changes. Now, how did I go from bankruptcy to the biggest giver among 14,000 members? Can you see it? How did that occur? God can't change. So he didn't change. Oh, but I did. <laughs> I got a hold of the word. I found out how to plant seed. I found out how to operate in God's financial plan. I found out that God wanted me to prosper. And I found out that when I prospered, then that part of the kingdom that I influenced also prospered. See, that's how we built that... 26 million dollar 
facility plus the land. That's how we did it, by the tithes and offerings of the people. That's all I did is teach them God's financial plan. And I led them in it, and I shared with them, and I let them know what God was doing in my life. And it inspired them and encouraged them. Ordinary people like us, we don't have no millionaires in our church. In the, you know, what we call millionaires that give big, large donations. I know the people, I saw one man give a million dollars to a ministry one time. I saw the check. He had it and presented it publicly, and I saw the check, million dollars. We ain't never had nobody give us no million dollars. But you don't need a million dollars. You get enough folk giving a thousand dollars, five thousand on a regular basis, and you get it done. Are you are you following what I'm saying? I don't have to be. I'm not concerned about bills. And I used to man, I, I was inundated with. That's why I had to declare bankruptcy. I couldn't pay the bills. <laughs> I'm too many bills. I don't have no bills to have to pay as such. Now I, I have a bank account that's called the JC account. It's a separate bank account, checking account. Only thing I write checks out of, that's where that check will come from, is from the JC account. All, it, all I do with it is give it away. And I got tens of thousands of dollars in it. All I do is just write checks out, give it to the kingdom, wherever the Lord leads me to do it. But not a few years ago, I was bankrupt. That's, that's what I want you to see. Bank, yeah, me, bankrupt. Bankrupt. They repossessed the car. They, yeah, they came and got it. And they, and, 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 they, they didn't ask me if they could took it. They just came and jacked it up and drove off with it. And I stood on the porch and said, bye bye car. Bye bye car. See, I'm, I want you to, I'm trying to let, get you to see a contract. And what I'm saying to you, notice the color of my skin, see. So you can't say, well, you know, that's because, uh-uh, no. No, no, right in the ghetto. God is the God of wherever you are. <laughs> See, he doesn't know the difference between the ghetto and the suburb. I mean, God doesn't know. He's colorblind. Are you following me? All right, did you find Mark chapter 1? If not, you will never find it. Now, I want you to listen to this very carefully. Verse 16. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Mm. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Yeah. Now, notice what it does not say. It does not say they were fishing. Anybody can fish, but everyone is not a fisher man. That was telling you their profession. It didn't say they were fishing because anybody can fish. It said they were fishers. That meant that was their profession. All right, now watch this now. Verse 17, And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway, the word straightway means immediately, they forsook their nests and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship, mending their nets. And straightway he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the ship with the hired servants. Yes, yes. Poor folk don't have no hired servants. <laughs> Said they left their father... Zebedee in the ship with not the hired servant singular, but with the hired servants with an S on the end, which is plural, meaning it had to be at least two. Hired servants. Poor folk don't have no hired servants. How many folk you got working for you? Hired Honey, you, you're not doing bad when you can hire folk to work for you yeah. and pay them a living wage and have enough left over for yourself. That's not a poor person. That's not a poor person. Now, I got two more. I, I'm going to just have to cut across. Oh, my Lord. So much, so much, so much, so much, so uh, much. Oh, my, 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 my. Um, mm. 
Okay, uh, let me see. Oh, I gotta get this in. I gotta get this in. Um, phew. Okay, t uh, <laughs> turn to Mark chapter, Mark chapter uh, ten. Now, while you're doing that, let me show you something. Again, this is where you have to use the wisdom of God to ferret out the truth. You see, you see the apostles were rich men. If you stop and think about it, that's the only person or persons that could afford to take off for three and a half years and not have to punch a clock. We have no record during the three and a half years of the earthly walk or ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ that he or any of his disciples ever held down gainful employment. So then how did they pay their taxes? How did they buy clothing? How did they buy food? And how did they have shelter? For three and a half years, we have no record that they ever worked. The only kind of people that could afford to do that would be rich people because they could live off their investments. Well, if you don't think that's true, is there anybody here in the choir, you're closest to me, is there anybody here in the choir that has a 40-hour week job? You work on a job. Hmm? You do? I need a married person with children. Are you a married man? You have children. Do the children live at home with you? How many children do you have? You have one child and a wife? Does your wife work? I bet she does. Yeah. And I don't mean that as a put down, but that's what it takes for most to have anything in this life. Both of you got to work. Okay. Now, how long have you been on your job? Oh, six months. You don't even qualify. Get out of here. <laughs> six months. Now, I need somebody. Where's your husband? Where'd he go? I know he's been there. I know he's been on his job. Who's been on a job for 10 years at least? 10 years or more. 10 years or more. 10 years or more. Okay. Here, I, want to, I want you to see this and you'll, you'll never forget this if I, I'm doing it this way because you'll never forget. You have a wife? You have children? Four-year-old? And you've been on your job for 10 years? 12 years. You, you get paid a salary by the week or every two weeks or every two. You get a salary. So you get a paycheck every two weeks. And with that paycheck, you're taking care of your family. Are you buying a home? In the process, you have an automobile. Are you making payments on a car? Okay. Now, <clears throat> so it takes you, is your, does your wife work? Three days a week, okay. So, but it's taking you and your wife, both of you working, to take care of the financial obligation that you have. And I'll guarantee you, you tell me if I'm wrong, I'll guarantee you that you're not banking 50% of your net income in savings every week. No, absolutely not. You're probably like most people. You're probably living up basically to most that you're making. Okay, is that a fair estimate? All right. We do television crusades around the country. And I need a man. I was watching you while you were singing in the choir. I need a man with, with, with your commitment and your dedication. I, I need a man with your, with, your, with your spirituality. I need a man with a kind of intestinal fortitude and a kind of spiritual commitment to the things of God to come and work with me on our crusades. Now, we do usually, this year we're not, but usually we do five, uh, four to six crusades in a year. And I need a man like you to come and work for me. And so what I'd like to do is offer you a job with Ever Increasing Faith Ministries. That's our DBA from Crenshaw Christian Center Church that I pastor. And, and here, here are the benefits. I pay no salary. You get no vacations. We have no benefits. And you work seven days a week and you don't get any days off. Do you think you'd like to come and work for me? <laughs> All he's doing, the guy's late, you don't even ask, he's just laughing. I don't think I can go with that, brother. Now, that sounded a little comical, but here's the, here's the atomic bomb truth I want you to get out of that. See, we have this Eurocentric idea about Jesus and the apostles, and because the Bible doesn't give us a blow-by-blow -blow account, it doesn't tell us every single thing, you've got to do some studying, some meditation, and let the Spirit of God move upon your heart to give you revelation. Don't you know that Jesus couldn't ask a business person or anybody to come and follow him without offering him a better deal than he already had? A man would be a fool to leave what he has to work for less than he has if anything you'd make a lateral move but you sure wouldn't take less than what you're making because you're probably living up to everything that you're making you've got to continue to make at least the same thing if not more 
Well, how do you think he could get those guys to follow him unless they were independently wealthy and could afford to take off for three and a half years and let their family be supported by their income from their investments and their interest? See, we never thought of that. We just thought, well, they ain't, they ain't got nothing. They're just a bunch of poor guys. No, look at this. John, uh, J uh, Mark, oh my goodness, Mark chapter 10. Oh, God, time, time. Stop in the name of Jesus. <laughs> well, the sun be stood still for Joshua, so I mean the clock will stand still for Fred. Stop. Well, if it does, it probably could have battery ran down. Okay, praise the Lord. All right, here we go. I'll be finished in just a moment. I'm going to give you two more. Oh, gee, I'll give you just two more things, and then, uh, then I'll sit down. Um, uh, um, let's see. <laughs> uh, where did I say? Mark chapter 10. Okay, uh, verse 17. Verse 17. So I just want, are you, has anybody thought about something a little bit different maybe than you thought of before I started talking about this? Give you just a, something else just to think about, a little something else? Okay, good. All right, listen to this. Verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now who came to whom? The man came to Jesus. Jesus didn't come to the man, right? Okay, watch this very carefully now. Verse 18, and Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none other, there is none good but one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. In other words, he said, I've been doing this all my life. I've been doing this all the time. Verse 21, then Jesus beholding him loved him and said unto him, one thing thou lackest. Have you ever been to college or, or high school or college? You ever take a test? You ever take a test and miss one question? And basically, let's say if you had a hundred questions, true and false, multiple choice or whatever, and you miss one question, what would your grade be? And so what kind of grade would you get? Probably an A. You know, this is pretty good. This man wasn't even born again, filled with the Spirit. Wasn't even a child of God, and Jesus said, you just got one thing lacking. Can the Lord say that about you tonight as a born-again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking Christian? Just one thing you lack. That's not bad. One thing. He said, one thing you lack. Now watch this carefully. And Jesus, beholding him, verse 21, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and take up the cross and follow me. Now, a lot of people, commentators, have gotten the wrong idea here and thought that what Jesus wanted was the man to be poor. But let's stop for just a moment and prove to you very uh, critically from the Word of God that could not have been the case at all. Why do you think Jesus told a man to keep the commandments? Because God Almighty had told the children of Israel, when you go into the promised land, if you will keep my word and do what I tell you to do, that I am the Lord who gives you power to get wealth that I may establish my covenant. But they had to keep his word, which were, for them, the commandments. Now this man said, oh, I've done that all my life. That's why the man had what he had was because of keeping the word of God. If Jesus or God had wanted this man to be poor, it would have been a violation of God's own word. Because what God would have been saying to the people of Israel, I lied to you. You can keep my commandment, but you're not going to prosper because I don't want you to prosper. Uh-uh. That's why he pointed out about keeping the commandments. And the guy said, I've done this for all my, for my youth up. And that's the reason why we get to verse 22. And the Bible says that he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had or because he had great possessions. That's how he got the possessions by keeping the word of God. It would have been impossible for God to have wanted the man to be poor because he would have violated his word. That's how the man got it, by keeping the word of God. Now, undoubtedly, the commentators here or the writers of the Bible misquoted this. Because it's not true. What's written there is absolutely not true. It, 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 it said he went away grieved for he had great possessions. That's not true at all. The reason the man went away grieved was because great possessions had him. And that's why Jesus, who perceived by the Spirit that the man was held in the bonds of that wealth and he was trusting in it, and in order for him to be able to get eternal life, he would have to willingly, volitionally cut himself off from that which was holding a grip over his life. 
Jesus didn't want him poor, but Jesus had to separate him from that which was holding him in bondage, which was the God of mammon, his wealth. And to show you how much of a hold it had on him, he could not give it up, not even for eternal life. Great possessions had him. He didn't have anything because if he had it, he could have given it up. But the possessions had him. You say, I have a smoking habit. I've been trying to quit smoking for five years. You don't have a smoking habit. The cigarettes have you, fool. If you had them, you could give them up. The very fact that you can't give them up attests to the fact that you're not in control. They're controlling you. A little white thing with tobacco stuff down it that's never been to college and can't even read or talk or write got you, a college graduate, climbing the wall at midnight trying to find another cigarette. No, the cigarettes have you. You don't have a drinking problem. The drink has you. Because if you had it, you could let it go. But the reason you can't let it go is because it has you. And until you are willing to give it up, you'll never be free. And we could go on ad infinitum. All right, follow along. Verse 22. And he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possession. Now get ready, hold on to your seats. Verse 23. And Jesus looked around about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? <gasps> Brother Price, you must be wrong. Jesus said a rich man can't get into the kingdom. Oh, no, that's not what it said. He said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And his disciples were astonished at his word. Now, why in the world would poor folk be astonished at the fact that the rich folk couldn't get in the kingdom? If anything, they would be whooping, hollering, glad, and saying, Woo, it's about time there's something that the rich folk can't get. We can get it, but the rich can't get in the kingdom. Why would they be astonished? Because the rich folk couldn't get in. Why would that astonish them? The only way it would astonish them is if they were rich. You know why? Because rich folk know that ordinarily if you're rich enough, you can buy whatever you want. You can buy people and sell them. You can have them murdered or you can have them to keep their life. You can have something. If they don't make it, you can commission it to be made if you have enough money. I had, I had a problem with certain kind of shoes because I have very tender feet. Have you ever heard of the tenderfoots? I be the original tenderfoot. Very delicate, very, very delicate feet. That's why I was talking to you, brother, uh, earlier about the fact I couldn't stand. I was asking you about how long we stand. My feet, they start hurting right away. I'm very tender. My, my wife can tell you my feet are soft like baby's feet. I've never been barefooted. I have very tender feet. And I, certain kind of shoes I wanted to wear, like these skins here like this brother has here. And I wanted to wear them. I bought, I don't know how many pairs of them. I had to give them away because I couldn't. I just, I put them on my feet. My feet. You talk about the dogs barking. Oh! Oh! Man, my feet were smoking. They were hurting so bad. But I asked my father about it. And see, I was talking about getting my feet healed. And my father said, well, why don't you have somebody make you some shoes that fit your feet? I said, I never thought of that. So I have my shoes custom made. To fit and they see they made a cast just to fit my tender feet and when I wear these shoes it's like not having no shoes on I just kind of float across the floor it feels so good now before you criticize that show me your cancel check stubs for over two thousand dollars a week to your church and then I'll listen to your criticism until then just zip your lip and put a Teflon zipper on it okay I'm trying to get you to see. I'm trying to lift your sights. I'm trying to elevate your sight. I'm not trying to tell you my business because I got the shoes before I ever told you about it. Been wearing them and got a closet full of them at home. Okay? So telling you ain't squat. But I'm trying to help you to elevate your sights. I got you got a living witness in front of you what God can do. We're just talking now about the... The material realm. You're going to hear about the supernatural and the supernatural and miracle work and power of God and all that kind of stuff. That's great and wonderful. But you need to live in this every single day. Every single day. You got to face the bills coming in every single day. You get a miracle for you now and then. Okay? All right, listen, listen, listen. And the disciples were astonished. Now, now follow this because this is really, this is great. And the disciples were astonished at his word. But Jesus answering, answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust, say trust. trust. That's the problem. That's the challenge. To trust in riches. It's hard 
for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure. Look at verse 26. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? If the rich can't get saved, who's going to get saved? Are you joking? It doesn't say they were astonished this time. It says they were astonished out of measure. Now, why would poor people be astonished out of measure about the fact that the rich couldn't get in the kingdom? What astonished them is that they were rich. And they said, man, well, who's going to get saved? <laughs> I mean, if rich folk can't live up on the hill, who's going to live on the hill? I mean, if rich folk can't eat the best of the land, who's going to eat it? Are you following? They, they said, oh, what, 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 what? See, now, Jesus, see, a lot of people get hung up on the camel business. Now, there's some that say that there, was a, there, there were these big gates that opened up into the wall cities, and then on the side they had a little smaller gate that they called the eye of the needle. I don't know. I wasn't there. Neither were you. But the issue is, what's the real problem about getting a camel? Well, let's go on, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, verse 27, And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. And so if all things are possible, then it's possible to get a camel through the eye of a needle. If you can't get a camel through the eye of the needle, then all things are not possible. Only some things with the exception of getting a camel through the eye of a needle. Huh? He said all things are possible. If all things are possible, then it's possible to get a camel through the eye of a needle. It's not a big thing. All you got to do is have a small enough camel and a big enough needle, and you can get the camel through the needle. <laughs> now, when I say that, people laugh. They think I'm trying to be funny. Have you ever heard of Goliath? They say he's about nine feet tall. He had to wear clothes back there. You didn't go to Hart Schaffner's and Marks and buy a suit. Or CNR clothiers like we have in California or some other place like that. The mother made the clothes. Can you imagine the little kind of sewing needle that you're talking about and thinking about is the kind of needle you got to squint up your good eye to try to see that sucker to get to, to get to thread through it. See, that's the kind of needle you're thinking about. But they had big needles that they made and used for tents, making tents, all kinds of things. You had a larger needle. All you got to do is have a small enough camel, big enough needle. It has to be possible because Jesus said it was. Now, quickly, he says then, now look at verse 28. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, 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 we have left all and have followed thee. All of what? What are poor folks going to leave? <laughs> we have left all. All of what? What you, what you left? What you, what you left all? All of what? Poor folk don't have nothing to leave but a welfare check. Are you seeing anything? He said, lo, we have left all. All of what? All of what? I'll, I'll be finishing in just a moment. I got one other, one other thing I want to show you, and then I'll, I'll, I'll quit. Please, g give me that little time. You're going to love this. Okay? And Jesus said, verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. It would be totally irrelevant and immaterial for him to say to people who had not left these things that people that had left them would have something. It would have no relevance to them whatsoever. But he said here very clearly, and Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or brother, or sister, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake in the gospel, but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mother, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. They had left these things. That's why Jesus said that to them. It would only have relevancy to them because they were the ones that answered the question by saying, Lo, we have left all. And he said, There's no man that hath left house, so they must have left house. Otherwise, it would have no relevancy to them. Are you seeing anything? Now, one last scripture, and I'm closing. I promise you, one last scripture. Turn to John quickly, and then we'll... And I'll, I'll, I'm, Carlton, please forgive me. I wouldn't just deliberately. I just feel that I, gotta, I have to share this. And it's going to bless the people. If they get, get this truth, get it in their spirit, you won't even have to do them to get up and say, look, we're going to receive our offering tonight. We need $400,000. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We believe we received. Pass the buckets five minutes. You'll have $500,000. That's the way it works when you get tuned into this. I'm not knocking anything else that's gone on before. I'm just simply pointing us to higher ground.
That's all I'm trying to get you to see. Just higher ground. I'm not knocking anything that's been done. Please believe me. God forbid I wouldn't do it. I want to point you to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Are you following me? Okay, that's all I'm trying to get to. Higher ground. All right, quickly, John chapter 13, and I'm out of here. Uh, oh, my, 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 my. I want you to see this. I told you that Jesus was wealthy, and I'm going to prove it to you. When I say prove it, I'm going to give you some scripture that will help you to at least, you know, think that I'm not completely off my rocker when you hear this. Now, um, oh, my, 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 my. Um, blah, 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 blah. Okay, uh, verse 18. Speak, he said, I speak not of you all. I know who I have chosen, whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come to pass that, or uh, before it come, that when it is come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do it quickly, or do quickly. Now watch carefully. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto them, unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, Buy those things so that means that had to be a money bag ah yes. uh, it had to be a money bag because it said buy buy those things buy say buy but B U Y, not B Y. buy okay listen uh, for some of them thought because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him buy those things that we have need have need of against the feast or that he should give something to the poor now why would they think that Why would that thought come to their mind? Why, why would that, you know, why would they think that he said go buy something for the feast or to give to the poor? Why, I mean, why would that thought come to their mind? It's customary. They didn't think he said go out and buy some snakes. They didn't think he said go out and, and, and invest it in the bank. They said go buy, go buy the stuff we have need of against the feast or go give something to the poor. The man, the man was given away to the poor all the time. Here's a poor man giving away to the poor. Now here's my final argument, Your Honor. Jury, here's my final argument. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Jesus, from what we can gather from the four Gospels, never worked on a job. He picked 12 men to follow him, and one of them was a thief. He was stealing out of that bag. See, the bag was the treasury. You know what a treasury is for? What? What's, what's a treasury for? What do you have a treasury for? No. See? You missed it. Why do you, what's a treasury for? Come on. Don't be afraid. I'm not trying to. It's not a trick question. I'm trying to get you involved. What is a treasury for? It's not for money. No. A treasury is not for money. What's a treasury for? No, not things of value. What's the treasury? See, you thought you already knew all this and you were going to sleep on me and see I'm shit telling you something you didn't even know. What's a treasury for? Organized money. No. Savings? No. Listen. Surplus. You only have a treasury if you have something left over after you've done your spending. If you spent it all, you don't need a treasury because you ain't got nothing to treasure. And if you don't need a treasury, you sure enough don't need a treasurer. And Judas was the treasurer, and he was stealing out of that bag for three and a half years, and nobody knew that he was stealing except Jesus, and he only knew it by the Spirit. I'm telling you that there had to be a whole lot in that bag for that sucker to steal for three and a half years, and nobody knew it. If you had three oranges and he stole two of them, everybody would know it.
all say amen can you see it he was the treasurer you don't have a treasury if you ain't got nothing to treasure just like some of you don't have a savings account because you ain't got nothing to save you living off everything you got there were some years ago that I didn't have a checking account was no point having a checking account I had nothing to check you don't need a checking account you ain't got nothing to check and you don't need a treasury unless you have surplus because if you're spending it all what do you need a bag for and what do you need a bag man for and Judas was the bag man and he was stealing out of that bag think about this too and I'm, I'm finished Jesus was one man and he had 12 you say you got how many kids one and you had how many kids how would you like for me to bring you 12 more kids tomorrow for you to take care of to house them bed them down educate them feed them clothe them 12 more could you handle it right now no it would bankrupt you and your wife and neither could you but here's a man who took care of himself plus 12 that was a staff of 12 plus 1 13 people he provided for them solely alone they never worked and they had a treasury with so much money in it that he was given away to the poor so often and so regularly that when the man went out to do something right away they said oh he probably said go give something else to the poor so he must have been pretty wealthy to be able to take care of himself plus 12 more that's 13 people that he was he had to transport house clothes pay taxes for buy new sandals for feed them every day for three and a half years and have money in the bank and have a rat a thief stealing out of it for three and a half years and nobody know it that's not a poor man God wants you to prosper you are welcome <laughs>